then there's me. Dot Walsh is an author and comes from Dedham, Massachusetts, and was former chaplain of the world-renowned Sherborne Peace Abbey, where she had opportunity to meet and interface with world peace activists, including Nelson Mandela, Mother Teresa, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Thich Nhat Hanh, Maya Angelou, and many others as part of the team at the Peace Abbey, where they she, Dot, and the others would present the Courage of Conscience Award. Dot has also served as chaplain in a number of the Massachusetts state prisons. And after finishing her work there and making some time to reflect on that work and all that she learned from the men that she worked with in those prisons, she wrote the book Finding Light in the Darkness stories from prison that bear witness to hope, faith, and love. She presently works as host for the Dedham Cable Television program, Oneness and Wellness, which has taken her on adventure of uh, over 105, I believe, uh, TV programs, including many interviews with people who are artists or activists, um, creative thinkers in helping the world around them become a better place. Also including a trip uh, to Vietnam with veterans returning to work on peace-seeking initiative and over to Cuba to explore the culture and its people recently as tourists now being welcomed in. She has also done film uh, interview projects in Boston on sex trafficking, um, uh, in, by interviewing some women uh, that she would meet um, on the streets of Boston. And she is presently working on filming individuals in a project on trauma with a perspective that looks at healing the emotional charge associated with the memory of the event. She has also recently started offering workshops at She Breathes Balance and Wellness Studio in Walpole and performs ceremonies for weddings, baby namings, memorial services, and provides pastoral counseling. She assists with the Engaging Peace organization and blog promoting peace and social justice in the world. And she is working on the stories and a future book project for Stonewalk, which you might hear about, where she has traveled around the world uh, transporting a stone with others representing the many innocent civilian lives lost due to war and violence. She also thinks up activist work uh, with creativity on the fly I can be witness to as on the day of uh, 2017 inauguration, uh, she put together a small impromptu group of inspirational circle on the Boston Common uh, next to folks talking about anarchy and uh, polar uh, topics, but uh, what she put a call for was for people to talk about inspirational leaders of peace in our world and to share a small sample of their work or writing. And she is here today to provide a presentation for you, a small sample of some of her work uh, and writing and stories. And uh, it involves a screen, which is part of her later work as well. So I'm not sure what is ahead, but I'm looking forward to it. And I invite you all to please welcome Dot Walsh up here. Well, the first thing I have to say is um, thank you, Cheryl. I, I, I didn't write all that. Where did you get all that information? <laughs> but that's Cheryl. She's just a wonderful person who inspires people to use their gifts to help others. So thank you again, Cheryl. And I'd also like to say that um, thank you, Polly, for those poems about the war because that's been part of my mission for a long time. So thank you so much. Um, is Ellen, <laughs> thank you. Is Ellen here? Ellen Piontek? 
No. Okay. Well, I'm going to start off with a poem that Ellen wrote. And I thought maybe if she was able to come today that she would be able to share it with me. She called it gratitude. And the subline is contemplations while cleaning the refrigerator to make room for new sensory events, creating space for more intimacy, love, fulfillment. And how it came about was she called me one day and said, uh, what are you doing for Thanksgiving? And I said, if I do nothing else, I'm going to clean my refrigerator. <laughs> so, so she wrote this. Moments shared with friends, spilling some wine, breaking bread, crumbs scattered and not forgotten, hiding in crevices, memories of pasta, pasta and Alfredo sauce, reminders of cheesy jokes, entertaining and flourishing like broccoli once alive and fresh, <laughs> grasping precious hours of alone time, meditative breathing born of smells and the savoring of smooth chocolate, pie crust, spilled lemonade, and once fragrant fruits now pungent with age. Thoughts marinated, at times rejected or expelled with force, wise enough to know when to be inhaled and digested, contemplative and mindful that we are what we don't eat. Meals nurtured with family, fresh mother's milk once flowing freely, now swimming downstream to bask in the sun, inhaling life and growing from years of sumptuous spinach, leaving behind only wilted remnants hiding in drawers, and some watered down frosty food, frozen and needing to be discarded, mushrooms absorbing the environment seeping the knowledge that when left to their own devices will turn to mold and be wasted, making use of time with intention. Thank you, Ellen. So I wanted to, uh, I was out at uh, She Breathes the other day, this wonderful studio that's been created in Walpole, and um, Alan O'Hare, which you might know, was there, and. Alan was sitting with me and he said, so what's inside of you, Dot? What kind of, you know, what, what's there? And I said, well, there's definitely the spiritual side, you know, that, um, and then whatever's right in front of me, I try to pay attention to, like people. And I said, that's really what I love. I love people. So this next part is called People in Life Circles. And we all have circles, circles of family, circle of friends, circle of events, circle of life stages, circles of coincidence, circles of poetry, poets, all kinds of circles. So I know that you all know about circles. So the first story I'm going to talk about is the circle of my family. And it's about Ma, Dad's mother, my grandmother. How could I like her? She was so different from my mother, who was lighthearted and fun and a redhead. Ma was serious and spoke with an accent. She came from a foreign country, and she was tall and dark-skinned. I was young, active, and very cautious, coming from the city to the farm where Ma and Pa lived. I loved the animals. I was allowed to bring the cows in from the pastures. Besides the cows, they had cats, a dog, and lots of chickens. And that's where my story really begins. We were walking in the yard where the chickens lived, Ma, Mama, and me. Suddenly, Ma picked up a chicken, and with a hatchet she took from her pocket, she knelt down, and wham, off came the chicken's head. It was so quick and unexpected, what happened next traumatized me. The body ran around headless, while the eyes and the head swirled around. What kind of grandmother was Ma? I looked at her with disgust. She was cruel, and she frightened me, and I would not forget what she had done. 
move the timeline from age 7 to 70. I was sitting in the office of a man who was explaining the therapy modality he uses with people who have suffered trauma, <coughs> helping them to remove the emotional charge from the memory of the incident. I was trying to understand it, so to give me a better idea of this process, he suggested I give him a story of something that is a recurring memory that is associated with some negative feelings. And what came to my mind immediately was the story of Ma's merciless murder of the chicken. What Patrick's does is, to, is a tapping. So as he talks, he asks the client to tap and then repeat what he says. I got it. But I was not ready for what happened. Tap, tap, tap. I followed his tapping on my forehead and repeated his words. Oh, the prissy little girl from Boston <laughs> came down to the farm with her plat black patent leather shoes. So I repeated it and I started to laugh. And we went on and we tapped and he spoke. And sometimes what he said was serious and sometimes it was very funny. At the closure, in a period of silence, he asked if when I pulled up the memory of the incident was anything different. What, what did I feel? Immediately, I felt differently about Ma. My first thought was she was a farmer living from the land, and my first feeling was compassion. I could feel compassion for her and there was none of those lingering feelings of fear or disgust I had previously felt. Here's the picture of Ma. I now keep it on my altar in my home. And it's Ma who helps me on my journey as I live through the rest of my life. Thank you, Ma. And then we have circle of friends, and as Ellen is a friend, and um, Cheryl is a friend, and there are other friends here. Um, I wanted to tell you about a friend that I met at Rosie's place. But first, I, I have a wonderful book, and maybe many of you know it. It's called Anamkara by John Donahue. And it's just such a beautiful book about all about life, our life. Uh, from and he died at a very early age and certainly was a very wise and wonderful spiritual person so he says deep within the human mind there is a fascination with the circle because it satisfies some longing within us so I keep seeing the circles and circles the circles in my life the circles in all of our lives so here's my story of Nye. A few years back when I was working at Rosie's Place in the South End as volunteer coordinator, I met Nye. She walked with one crutch, a kerchief on her head, and a smile on her face. We became friends, although she could be argumentative with other guests. We always got along very well. It was obvious she was bright and educated, and people always wondered, how did she become homeless? What was her story? I never asked her to tell me her story. I was just happy to be friends with her. Setting up the volunteer training, I suggested having Nye as part of the program, giving a perspective from a guest's point of view. And so she joined me. Now, I tell you, not everybody was crazy about that idea. They said, well, you know, there should be the separation between the volunteers and the guests. And my whole time at Rosie's Place, it was bringing people together, guests and volunteers, and trying to bridge that gap. When I left Rosie's, I continued to meet with Nye. I took her for a visit to the Peace Abbey, and we spent time in the multi-faith chapel, and she loved it. Many times we would have breakfast together at a local grill. 
Sitting in the car before we went, we went in, Nye would bring out a napkin and had it all folded up, and she would take out some special treat that she wanted to share with me. She would carefully unwrap what she had brought, and this so soulful gesture always felt like the sharing of communion. I felt like I was so blessed to be in her presence that she was so special. As time passed, I lost contact with her, though she never left my thoughts and never left my heart. Last Christmas, I received a newsletter from Rosie's Place with a feature story about Nye. And this is what I learned. The social worker who spent seven years with Nye found out that she came from Egypt and was an immigrant to this country. She went to nursing school and received a graduate degree from Yale. She met a man, she married him, and she had a little girl. Unfortunately, this man was abusive and at times very cruel. Finally, she had enough courage to leave him and move to an apartment where she stayed until a tragic fire destroyed everything and all of her possessions. All she had was her little girl. And then one day, as her daughter was crossing the street, she was hit by a car and killed. After losing her home and daughter, her life began to fall apart. She lost her job and began to suffer emotionally and mentally from all the losses. Taking to the streets, she wandered from shelter to shelter until Rosie's place offered her stability and a second chance. In 2014, Nye began to tell her story. With some research, her family was contacted and a plan was put in order to help Nye to realize her dream and to go back to Egypt, her homeland. She lived out the remainder of her, her life enjoying tea at the beach and good times with her family. In 2016, she passed away at the age of 84. I am so grateful for the people, the loving staff at Rosie's Place, who took care of her and finally were able to bring her to this beautiful ending. And so for my third uh, sharing with you today, as Polly talked about the war, I'm going to be showing a, um, a short video about Stonewalk Island. And as um, Cheryl said, Stonewalk took place in many different places in the world. It was in the United States and Ireland and England and after 9-11 uh, with Families for Peaceful Tomorrows and then in Japan and Korea. And it still goes on because um, when I went to Vietnam, I took the little, the little um, model of the stone uh, with the inscription on it, unknown civilians killed in war, and took that to Vietnam with me. And uh, that was a, an amazing journey. So um, I'm going to call on this wonderful staff at HCAM who, <laughs> who helped me um, put this up and uh, with my husband also. So um, I think we're ready. In 2000, I spent a month on the road in Ireland. The most moving part of this journey was being in Northern Ireland as the people began to experience the possibility of peace. The Good Friday Agreement was just brokered between the two warring factions. The video and music from that journey were created by my husband, Andy Sally, who was part of the Stonewalk team. This was a country suffering for a hundred years from politics and religion, 
power, and hatred. The young, poisoned by the elders, killing one another without understanding why. They are tired of burying bodies, living behind wire fences. They are looking for hope. They are looking for peace. We came, not a large group, just a few, pulling the stone through Belfast, remembering those who would no longer walk the hills or meet in the pubs or kiss their children goodnight. We walk through the streets with the stone, a military helicopter flying above us, and behind us on the street, young boys on bikes with angry, hardened faces. We pass the painted buildings, each one telling a story of tragedy. The song tells it all, the sadness of loss. My brother, my sister, where have you gone? Taken from this life, now we're alone. In a field of green grasses, we lay you down and hold on to the memory of you with a song. Know that you won't be forsaken as we are all here to carry you home and to honor forever your life with a stone. We could smell the white clover after the rain as we walk to your resting place calling your name. I can still hear your laughter and promises we made to remember the good times if we'd ever see this day. For your spirit and your love, no need to atone as we honor forever your life with a stone. So although this is a very somber piece, it's also a very hopeful piece because Northern Ireland is now experiencing peace. And although we see all over the world and in this country violence, people choosing war and choosing a negative, there are all very many people, there are people out here who are working to make peace and to bring peace to this world. So there's always hope. And um, I know uh, people that are teaching mindfulness, the poetry, the building within our own families, each one of us has a responsibility for that. And so f for me, I see this is Easter weekend, a time of resurrection, the newness of spring, <coughs> hope, hope for all of us. So rather than, and I, I'm eternally like this, I want to focus on the positive, on the, on the people that are making changes all over the world in every single country. I'm now finding out that children are wired, hardwired for compassion. So there is hope. And I thank all of you for the work that you do I thank especially Cheryl for all of the work that she does in bringing people together and encouraging myself and others to do the work. I thank Louis Randa for being my friend and for keeping on, still doing the Courage of Conscience Award. And it's, it's, life is good. So thank you all. Thank you for listening. This poem is called Permission. Ma said I could. I'd tilled the soil round the willow tree, transplanted Queen Anne's lace and milkweed, pulled from the strawberry patch. Joe towered over me. Why aren't you playing like the other kids? Uh, I thought I was. Why are you planting weeds? Uh, 
I love these wildflowers. I planted beets and carrots. Yesterday, 69 years later, I read in the Gazette, plant milkweed in your garden, save the monarch butterfly. Finally, permission. <laughs> the moon loves the earth. Even though we've covered her with shopping malls and oil rigs and misery, she looks down from the sky perfect and new crescent, sees me as I drive to Home Depot for junk, and she says, I love the earth, and some night, you might embrace, some night you will embrace her as I embrace her tonight, and leave the road and the oil and the blood behind. I wrote this one yesterday. It's called Holy Saturday. This is not a good day. Unfulfilled prophet promises still in their grave clothes haunt the citizenry. All their hopes lay denied. No mercy, no grace, just misery and desolation of sadness. Where are the faithful, you ask? They stand in the still dark outside the tomb with the light of miraculous belief in their steadfastly hopeful hearts. Happy Easter. Fly, PD, fly. Words, I see them. Words, I hear them. Words, I feel them. My soul aches as a songbird flies away. His flight was inevitable. It still saddens me. The sky opens its arms to him, and he disappears. I cannot say how I feel. It hurts too much. I hear his song in my head and in my heart and will remember him forever. Thank you. Peach and pear.